All right, well, several weeks ago, we started doing something a little different on Wednesday nights, and that is um, allowing anybody that wants to, either somebody here in person or somebody online, to ask a question, a Bible-related question, and us go through and try to give that uh, as an answer without preaching a sermon on it. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. So Brother Kevin had asked me a question many months ago, and he renewed that question uh, recently. And his question was, during the tribulation period, after the rapture of the church has already occurred, those that have heard the gospel before the rapture but rejected it, did not get saved, and therefore did not go up in the rapture, will they have an opportunity to be saved during the tribulation period? And so what I want to do tonight is try to answer that question. I see a yes and I see a no. Uh, So tonight I'm going to show us several passages. And, you know, as always, it's not what does the preacher think? What does anybody else think? What does the Bible say? My question is based a lot on that Left Behind book series. Okay. And how how there's 16 of the best-selling Christian books in the history of Christian books. And they're all And they're wrong. Okay, so Kevin is putting a caveat to his question, and that is uh, the Left Behind book series by Tim LaHaye and uh, Jerry Jenkins, I think it was. Um, They portray in that series of novels, which is what they are, but they're novels somewhat predicated on actual Bible prophecy. Um, Kevin is saying in that series of books they would lead one to believe that someone who has heard the gospel before the rapture and didn't get saved can still get saved after the rapture takes place. So as I told Kevin uh, in the past, I've never read those books. He said, well, go read one of them this week. And my response was, I have a to-read stack that is already pretty tall, and so that one is way down the list. I don't know if or when I'll get to that. But, of course, we don't want to base what we believe based on what any book says but this book. And Kevin makes a good point, though, a valid point, that if it is true that the Bible teaches something different than that, it sure is a shame that that a best-selling series of books in the Christian genre would be teaching something that is different than what the Bible says. So let's look at that question tonight. So there are, first of all, two different groups of people left in the world after the rapture takes place. So I'm going to make a little division on the whiteboard here. There are those that have never heard the gospel and those that have heard the gospel that will be left behind. Now, of those that have never heard, we know there will be people that will be saved during the tribulation period. In fact, during the first three and a half years, it seems that that's the period of ministry of the two witnesses in Israel that will be, they'll have a ministry similar to Moses and Elijah, and their preaching and their signs and miracles will be somewhat the reason that that 100 and, that's right that 144,000 Jewish young men virgins will receive Christ as their Messiah I believe during that first three and a half is the way it seems to appear and then they will during the latter three and a half years they will be the ones going throughout the world evangelizing all those that are left behind trying to win people to Christ And so certainly they will be among those that have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. And I'm certain that the vast majority of those to whom they preach throughout the world will be people who have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Because let's face it, the majority of the world, even if they've heard the name of Jesus, most of the world has not heard a clear presentation of the gospel in spite of the missionary efforts of Bible-believing churches up to that point. So those that have never heard, we know some of them will be saved. So we're dealing primarily with those who have heard the gospel in a clear way before the rapture takes place. Will they be able to be saved? Now, 
If you have your Bibles or your Bible app, uh, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and let's look at several verses here. This is, of course, one of the passages in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul deals with the rapture and then the tribulation to follow, including the revealing of the Antichrist. And your pastor has preached a sermon just within the last year and a half on this particular passage because I believe this is a proof positive passage that the rapture of the church is a pre-trib rapture of the church. That's not what we're talking about tonight, but I do believe that's one of the things that is very apparent from the book of 2 Thessalonians. But let's key in on just this question, this issue tonight. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning in verse 8. Now, we're going to look at it verse by verse, and in a few cases here in a minute, word by word, because we want to get it right. Here's what it says, starting in verse 8. And then, that is after the rapture and uh, after the Holy Spirit is taken out, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of His mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of His coming. Wicked is capitalized probably in your English Bible there. This is talking about the wicked one, and we know that to be the person of the Antichrist. Verse 9, Even him, that is the wicked one, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going he's to do miracles that look like he's God. Yeah but they're lying wonders. He's not God. He's presenting Himself as God, but He's not God. All right, look. He's an imitation. That's right, a counterfeit. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. So He deceives them in His unrighteousness. And those that are deceived by Him perish. And then the second half of verse 10 says, because, because they believed, excuse me, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, the word in verse 10 at the end that I want us to look at, especially, is the word received. The word received here is a past tense verb. So it's saying that those that are deceived by Him will perish because they received not the love of the truth. Well, the love of the truth, of course, includes the truth of the gospel. It includes the truth of who Jesus is, the way, the truth, and the life, that they might be saved. So... The question here, at least part of the question, before we even get down to verse 12, part of the question we have to ask ourselves in verse 10 is, when was it that they received not the love of the truth? Now, I will not rule out the possibility that they may hear the love of the truth. They may hear the truth from one of the 144,000 Jewish missionaries. But barring that, um, we know that at some point they have heard the truth. So these are people that have heard the truth. It would seem to indicate from a plain language reading of the passage that these are people who are left behind in the first place because they didn't receive the love of the truth. But it says at the end of the very end of verse 10 that they might be saved. So they didn't get saved. They weren't in the rapture uh, when they when they received the, when they could have received the truth. But let's leave the caveat. Let's leave the possibility that they heard the truth after the rapture. Let's continue on reading, verse 11. And for this cause. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So verse 11 tells us when they get the delusion. So 
they reject the truth, then they receive a delusion. Now, I also want to make this clear too, though it's not directly what we're talking about. It says that God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. It does not say that God lies to them. God is not the author of lies. He's not the father of lies. Who's the father of lies? Satan. Satan. So the lie is Satan's lie. And we know Satan is going to put forth a big lie, and that lie is that he is God. God's not the one putting out the lie, but those who have rejected the truth, God is going to cause them to not be able to see things as they are. That's what the word delusion means. Not being able to see things for what they really are. So Satan is the one with the lie, but anyone that rejects the truth, God is going to prevent them from being able to see the truth, and they're going to believe the lie. All right? But let's go on to verse 12. Because, well, if we didn't do yes. that, they would probably spend the entire tribulation period, there'd be lots of suicides because they'd all know what they missed. Okay, well, Kevin makes a good point. They, they if, well, I mean, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, hiding a birthday party from a kid, you know? If they find out there's going to be a party before there is one, there's no surprise anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me like if everybody figures it out, I mean, if, they, if you've heard it, then you're familiar with it or you know, and you, then you should, you're going to think you know where everybody went now. What? So yes. Now you've got to spend the next seven years suffering. And then I, I would imagine a lot of folks just kill themselves. And if God just if God just makes them kind of just fall into the current world system instead of worrying about where everybody else went, then then everybody hangs in there until the end to, to kill themselves or just Okay, I think Kevin makes a, a valid point. Kevin's saying if if they could see the truth for themselves and see what they missed they would just all be committing suicide because of what they gave yeah. up, the opportunity. They, once, once everybody disappears, it would be like shining a huge light on it. They, they, if they weren't sure before, they would really be sure then. Okay. TR, you want to say something? Another thing is, after the Antichrist comes on the scene and the, the beast, who is the false prophet, will become uh, convincers of the nations that to night and then the unity is all they focus on because whether it be aliens or seismic events or any number of things they're like okay everybody disappeared atomized maybe Thanos became a thing or something yeah TR makes a good point the antichrist and the false prophet are definitely going to do their best to unite the lost peoples of the world um, and follow them and worship the dragon that's their that's their purpose they're aware of the truth be like a copy of Babel too, because it'll just be a Nimrod situation where everybody is focused on let's beat whatever did this instead of focusing on the laws. You'd have millions of people pointing at him, going, "That's the Antichrist." We know now. So, so TR's saying all of this stuff we see with Hollywood and entertainment worldwide is is preparing people for the supernatural stuff. And Kevin's saying, on top of that, if these people were not deceived and allowed to believe the truth, then they would God's they would be plan. pointing their attention fulfilled. at the Antichrist. Yeah, God's plan couldn't be fulfilled. The whole everything that's written, everything that's supposed to happen couldn't happen. So so let's Kevin just use the word God's purpose. God has a twofold purpose for the tribulation period. One is for the Jews, for Israel, and one is for the, the lost Gentiles of the world. His purpose for the tribulation regarding the lost Gentile nations of the world is literally just to mete out uh, punishment for the wicked. God is going to give the world what they've always wanted, a world without Him, and that's what they're going to get for that seven years, and they're going to they're going to be the receivers of how bad it is. To figure it out, to figure the Messiah out for themselves. And so his plan for Israel is not to punish them, but as Kevin was just alluding to, to purify them. They're going to be the majority of, of Jews 
Israelites during the tribulation, the majority of them are going to be wiped out also. Only a remnant of them are going to be left at the very end of the seven years. At at the end of the seven years, literally just before they're annihilated by the armies of the Antichrist, they're going to, all of them that are, that are left, are going to cry out and res- accept Him as the Messiah and beg Him to return. And that's the moment when He will split the eastern sky, come back, destroy all their enemies uh, there at the Battle of Armageddon, and they will go with Him into the millennial reign of Christ. Um, and if the Jews have millions of Gentiles screaming at them, hey, look what we just missed, they're just going to continue with their rebellion. Why would they listen to us? They okay. think we're stupid anyway. So you're, you're figuring this out for yourself. Jews are going to Jew. So God's purpose for the tribulation is twofold. For the Gentiles, it's to punish the wicked Gentile nations of the world. For the Jews, it's to purify Israel and bring them to a point that they receive Him as the Messiah. Now, let's go back to our passage and let's look at verse number 12. Verse 12 says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And of course... The word damned, it means condemned to hell. And the, that's predicated on the fact that they believed not the truth. So if they believed not the truth, that's where we have to go back to to answer the original question. When did they believe not the truth? Well, They were presented with the truth if they heard a clear presentation of the gospel before the rapture took place. Now, I am not totally ruling out the possibility someone could argue that, well, maybe they had another chance during the tribulation and they rejected it. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible only says that when they heard the truth, they believed not the truth. And because they believed not the truth... God turned them over to delusion to believe the lie that they might be damned, that they might be condemned to hell. So at this point, I'm going to say something and then go into another couple of verses here before we stop. It is your pastor's uh, very strong conviction that that place where they believed not the truth was before the rapture took place. And that once the rapture takes place, I do not believe if they heard a clear presentation of the gospel that they will get another chance to believe the gospel. I believe immediately when the tribulation takes place and the rapture occurs, I do not personally think that the Scriptures give us any reason to assume that they're going to get another chance to hear and believe. Like and repent. Kids watch their parents wrap the Christmas presents. You'll have to develop that thought for me a little more. <laughs> the kid watched his parents wrap his, wrap his own Christmas present. There's yes. no surprise. He knows what's in the box. Yeah. What's the point? So, okay. So, yeah. And it, it makes sense, but again, we're back at the point where we've got a 16 series best selling <laughs> set of novels. A okay. Series well, that is, that follows the pre-trib thing and everything exactly the way we believe it, exactly mm-hmm. the way you would preach it, except for this one thing. And and I'm going to tell you, and they, oh, well, I'll they just... Got, and they, I, I think you're right. They, they got it wrong. And it's, but that would, a lot of people. Well, that, think, would, that would be a hard sell to the is, casual American Christian. I, oh yeah, I but, I, but I also think God is a, such a merciful God. He is so merciful that he will give I think he's willing to give anybody another chance. I mean Well that's just, that's but that's I mean, not what the Bible says. Is he, the, is he more merciful than he is just though? That that's right. Well he's both. I know. But see the passage doesn't say anything about another chance. It says those that reject the truth are made to believe a lie. And so, you know, our God certainly is a gracious God. 
He has the right to do whatever he chooses to do. It says here, because they receive not the love of the truth. That's right. That they might be saved. That's right. They didn't say they weren't. It says might. They rejected it, is what that's telling us. They rejected the truth. It, they might be saved, though. There's a might in there. The, the word might means because they could have been saved, but because they rejected the love of the truth, now they can't be saved. They could have been, but now they can't oh, be. That's the way the might there yeah, is. Yes, ma'am. All right, so, but, but let, let me share one other thing before we stop uh, for tonight on this. There are a couple of things about the mark of the beast that I think figure into the answer to the question. If you still have your Bible open, turn over with me to Revelation, and I'm just going to quickly look at a few verses, starting with Revelation 13, beginning with verse 15. I don't mean to interrupt you, but yes, I've been listening to this preacher, and he says that the mark of the beast is not the six sixes that's put on your body. Nothing's put on your body at all. It's what's put in your head. That's what he says. Well, we're going to stick with what the Bible says. There are lots of preachers and books that say lots of different things. Yeah. Let, let's read. Let's read right here and see what it says. Verse fifteen says this. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that's the false prophet, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So those that choose not to worship the Antichrist are going to be killed by the Antichrist and the false prophet. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Not, not in their mind, but in their hand or their foreheads. There is going to be something with physical presence. Right. An actual mark. And by the way, that word mark means to stick or to prick. Um, so we'll talk more about that in a moment. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six, or six, six, six. So the passage is teaching us here in Revelation 13, the mark is going to be a literal mark, a physical mark of some sort, either on the hand or in the forehead. And the word mark means uh, to stick or to prick. Now, we have all seen and heard just within the last five years technologies that have come out now that where things can be um, put into the human body. I don't think we've yet seen what... I don't think we've yet seen the mark. What we are seeing are the precursors for that preparing the way for the mark that is coming. A, a microchip or something like that. The interesting thing about the chips they've come out with is that we know they're planning to get rid of all cash and move everybody to a digital currency so that they can, number one, track everything, and number two, tax everything. And when they do that, you'll have to have a chip either in a card or in your body to do any kind of transactions. There are some people that already have those chips inserted in their bodies as a test run. Who would, whoever would be dumb enough to do that? That's a different story. Yeah. So, all right, hold on. Let, let, let me go a little further here, and, and then I'll take some more comments. Now, look with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 14, <clears throat> the next chapter over, <clears throat> verse number 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image 
and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So this passage says anyone who has taken the mark has chosen to worship the dragon. The Antichrist is pointing people to the dragon, which is Satan. So anyone who has taken the mark, their their fate is sealed. Even among some of the wishy-washy Bible scholars, they too even agree with conservative Bible scholars that the Bible is pretty clear here that anybody that receives the mark, their opportunity to make a different choice after that is gone. There's no more opportunity to repent whether they were somebody who had heard the gospel before the tribulation or hadn't heard the gospel. If you take the mark, your your free will is gone at that point. So then I want us to think... You put your faith in a different system than God's. Yes, you put your faith in, in Satan's system. That's right. So I want us to think for a minute. All throughout Scripture... You know, God gives man a free will when to choose, whether to choose him or not to choose him. When a person takes the mark, they cease to have that option of free will to make a choice, even to repent after that. I think the scripture is clear. The passage, I believe, may have something to do with some of the things that we have heard just within the last couple of years, the new technology that is out. When something is injected into a person's body that has the potential to change their DNA, it changes, it changes the organism that it's put into. And by law, international law, if you change the DNA of something to the point that it's not what it originally was, then whoever owns the patent for what was put in there that changed that person is the new owner of that organism that was changed into something new. Now, I think this is the legal mechanism by which someone is going to become the property of Satan. But these things, they've also been doing all of their testing and scheming for years to find the gene or genes in a person's DNA that that makes them uh, willing to stand up to authority. Now, Hitler and the Nazis tried this in the 1930s. They actually, the reason that fluoride was first used in water... Uh, it was actually used to try to make people more docile so they wouldn't stand up to the government. You may or may not know this. You may or may not like hearing this, but fluoride treatment in water was first used by the the Germans in the Jewish uh, places where they were rounded up to make them more docile so they wouldn't be... More submissive? Yes, make them more submissive, exactly. Exactly. So the things they have come up with today are far beyond that. They believe they've isolated one or more genes that cause us troublemakers uh, to not want to go along with whatever the government tells us to do. Now, whether they have or haven't found that switch yet, I don't know. But I suspect at some point they may very well find the switch And when they inject whatever they're going to inject into people that is the actual mark of the beast, I think it's very likely that it will have the ability to flip that switch, which in my best judgment, looking at everything we're seeing in our day and time, may be the explanation for why someone no longer has a free will once they accept the mark, because they'll flip that switch and that person, they're just going to, they're just going to be a, a mind-numbed zombie. TR, there's the zombie thing. Yeah, an automaton that's going to do whatever they're told to do. So whether that's the mechanism that Satan uses or not, I don't know that. It seems very suspicious anyway, very possible. But nevertheless, they are definitely going to lose their free will if they take the mark. I think all of that plays into the part of people rejecting the truth. If they take the mark, they're definitely going to reject the truth. It's over at that point. But I think from the verses we saw tonight in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
at the point that someone rejects the truth and the, the Spirit of God is taken out in the manner that He currently works when the church is taken out, that's when the lie is introduced and I don't see anything in this book that gives me any reason to believe that someone who has heard a clear presentation of the gospel has a chance to be saved after that. I will tell you there are some good Bible-believing Bible scholars that would disagree with your pastor over that. And um, it's not something I would split, you know, uh, uh, separate fellowship with anybody over. But I would much rather err on the side of telling people and preaching from the pulpit that if you don't make your decision now, you're not going to have a chance after that than for me to tell people you'll get another chance even if you find the rest of us gone one day and then them find out that I lied to them and they don't get a chance. I think the Scripture is clear that they don't get another chance and your preacher is going to keep preaching that every time I get in the pulpit and, and we tackle that subject. you got a better chance with a deathbed conversion. I, I, I think so. TR? I'll tell you what I think too. I, I, I guess maybe I'm wrong and maybe this is just all in my head, but I, I think the mark is a mark. A mark to me is if I take a crayon and put something on this wall, everybody can see that. And I, I think that's what the mark is meant for. The mark is meant to be seen. It's meant to be able to yeah. Authorities, police, heraldry, whoever's in charge, can they know, and they know who hasn't taken that mark. Now, I mean, and I kind of think, I mean, again, this is just personal thing, but I, I think that the whole chip thing is a is a red herring kind of deal. I think it, everybody runs after that because they just assume. But I'm not saying that they can't be combined. You can have both. You can because you got you got to have something to to buy with. Purchase. Right. I mean, you, it certainly may be something that's visible to the naked eye, but it doesn't have to be because they're going to know who does and doesn't have it because everywhere you go, anything you want to do, you're going to have to be scanned yeah. if it is. I mean, there's tattoo technology that right. could do the same thing. That's, that's right. You know, nano stuff or whatever. Yeah. Uh, QR codes, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, TR, you had something? I was just going to say that uh, seems like a lot of that you can get saved after the tribulation has begun and started or even if it's at the very end and you really feel like you can't take it anymore so you can go ahead and get saved even if you've heard it before I think that's what a lot of people use to say that uh, the, the hippie theory about Jesus that Jesus saw uh, not just willing to forgive but he's literally it seems like the same argument I've heard people give over the tribulation not at all being the judgment which is exactly what it is but to be a scare to make people accept Jesus because if everyone can accept Jesus after that, which that would include everyone, then there would be no need for the tribulation because that means that God could just scare everyone into salvation and everyone would get saved. And that whole tribulation thing is all pointed back to those Jews. Everything is about their timetable. His timetable with them. You're right. It, it, the tribulation period is specifically for the Jews. It's, it's God bringing them to a point that they are willing to accept Him. That's exactly right. That's why we're not going to be here because it doesn't have anything to do with the church. Mary? Uh, uh, we're talking about the uh, uh, tribulation. You know, what, what was talking about a while ago? Yes, ma'am. The Bible says that uh, God will not always strive with man when he's call, trying to call people to, to be saved. That's true. That's right. So, and at some point, he says, this is it. Yeah. That's yeah. what he did with he Pharaoh. He not come back either after that. That's right. When he said, this is it, and he, that's it for him. I mean, he will not come back to, to fool with him anymore. You're right, Mary. Pharaoh hardened his heart and hardened his heart and hardened his heart, and finally God hardened his heart too, gave him what he wanted. Yeah. And after that, there was there was no opportunity for repentance. Exactly. Good this point. This other preacher I've been listening to too, he says that, I know this is crazy, he says some, I mean, I listen to him because the things he says is so, he says that when you, when the, uh, uh, when the, when Jesus called, you know, when one's taken and one's left behind, he said, 
do not go with the one that's taken because that is that is the devil taking you. You want to be the one left behind. Miss Doris. Said, the Bible does not say that. Miss Doris, you leave that you, you leave that <laughs> you leave that other preacher uh, off the radio or TV and just come to Pinnacle some Baptist the, Church. Some of the crazy things you know, oh. I've never heard before, you know? Yeah. What you said? What you? Yeah, I don't go to church. <laughs> no, he said don't go to. Don't. Yeah, go to regular church. Yeah, yeah turn that other one off. Yeah. We we got a seat for you right here at Pinnacle Baptist every service. All right. Um, well, you can come to your own conclusions. You've all seen the scriptures, but you you know what your preacher believes, and you see now why I believe it, and I feel very strongly about it. Uh, but I won't be offended if you feel. Otherwise, after so seeing the scripture, the rapture is God calling us out. That's absolutely Him calling the church out. Yes, calling the church. That's what that's, I've that's right. Heard. Because the tribulation the is not for us. Left in the, he, the two people they say it's Moses uh, and Elijah. They they, they will have they a ministry it. similar to Moses and Elijah. I don't think it will be actually Moses, Moses and Elijah. Elijah. I used to think that it was. I, I don't think it will be. Uh, anymore. All right. I'm gonna. St- that was supposed to be a short answer. I know it wasn't, but I appreciate the fact that every one of you are, were engaged and involved tonight. It, it is a hard truth. Um, no, no, because it's not popular. But one of the things that I I, I want us to do in these times on Wednesday nights is what we just did where we take a passage of Scripture like we did last week and we just say, okay, we know this is what a bunch of people think and believe and talk about, but, but what does the Bible teach? And us, us see how do you learn from the passage itself just going to the Bible. And if, if we all learn how to take a passage and dig out the answers for ourselves, hey... That's what a pastor's job really is, is to teach everybody else in the congregation to do that for yourselves because the pastor's not always going to be here. One day I'm going to be buried out back with the Methodist. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let, let me pray, and that will also officially start our very short business meeting we're going to have here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for a chance to study Your Word and Lord, we understand that some of these passages we look at are not, they're not fun to see the truth, but they are the truth. And Lord, we have an obligation to tell the world around us what the truth is and not allow them to be caught unaware. So Father, use us, give us compassion for the lost, but give us, I pray, the sense of urgency that we should have to win the lost to the best of our ability while we still have the opportunity. I pray now you bless in our short business meeting to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.